بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إن الله اختار من النساء أربعا مريم وآسيا وخديجة وفاطمة صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم The tenth day of the holy month of Ramadan coincides with the wafat of أم المؤمنين خديجة الكبرى صلوات الله وسلامه عليها this noble lady who is so great that one day the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله says that after my معراج my ascension when I came back when I was when I returned جبرائيل عليه السلام أو جبرائيل he told me, I asked, do you have a need? Do you have something? He said, yes, I have a haja. He said, what's your need? He said, I want you to convey the salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from me to Khadija, alayha salam. So the Prophet said, I went to Khadija and I told her, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mess and Jibra'il send you his their salams. So she replied, she said, Inna Allah huwa salam, wa minhu salam, wa ilayhi salam, wa ala Jibra'il salam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is himself. He calls himself as salam al mu'min al muhaymin as salam. It's one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from him always comes peace from Allah. And to him always goes peace. Wa ilayhi salam. And then wa ala Jibra'il as salam. And she conveys the salam upon Jibra'il as well. This lady was so great. She gave everything she has to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. She sent her servant a man by the name of Maysara. She sent him with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to do business. She asked the Prophet to do business for her. So he went with her, with him, and she told Maysara, keep an eye on him and tell me everything, every detail about him. So Maysara said, I went there, I kept a good eye on him. And Maysara was also a wise person. He was a servant of Khadija, but he was also a wise man. When he returned, it is said that Abu Jahl, the whole time he was jealous of the Prophet. This young man taking the whole business, the whole caravan of Khadija. Who is this young man? They used to refer to him as Yatimu. Bani Hashim, the orphan of Bani Hashim, our holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The orphan of Bani Hashim, this poor man. When in fact all the honorable people of Quraysh, it is said, approached Khadija to ask her for marriage and she refused. Then she's coming to get this man who's so poor to run her business and run her affairs. Nonetheless, when they returned, it is said that 
everybody started selling whatever goods they brought from Sham because the caravan went to Sham. The Prophet didn't sell anything. He kept everything. He kept all the caravans and all the camels loaded. People sold, sold, sold. Abu Jahl was happy. He's like, good, you know, this guy did not sell anything. So it's good. It's going to be very bad for business. However, the next day, more people came to buy things. But everybody has sold all his goods. Everyone. Except who? Our Holy Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So he told people, you want to buy? Now you want to buy? You have to buy at this price. And he made lots of profits for Khadija alayhi salam. The only person with a price or with the goods in the market. No competition. So Maysara, you know, people, the businessmen are shaking their heads. You know, this is good to learn, you know, from the Holy Prophet. See, people, I tell you, come to the majalis of Ahlul Bayt. You will learn about Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Even for your business. The problem is people don't attend the majalis of Ahlul Bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, Maysara then went to the Khadija and he told her, he told her, this man is an amazing man. He's amazing. And he spoke to her of everything that he witnessed. One of the things, he said the whole journey in the desert, there was a cloud covering him. And not only was the cloud covering him, it was, there was a breeze under that cloud. So people tried to get close to the Prophet to get from the breeze, like air conditioning. No, air condition around the Prophet so she really was admired by this of what she heard she called the Holy Prophet Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad hadith of the Prophet says or the Ahlul Bayt now I'm not sure if it's the Prophet but there's a hadith that states the old person in his home or in his family or among his community should be respected as the prophet in his nation. That's, that's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Nonetheless, so she approached the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and she told him that I would like you to marry me and all my dowry is on me, everything. So would you accept this? The Prophet was, of course, happy to hear this. No doubt, Khadija was the most honorable lady or one of the most honorable ladies in Quraysh. One of the best ladies in Quraysh. So the Prophet went to his uncle Abu Talib and he told him. Abu Talib was surprised. Khadija, this rich lady, this noble lady, would want his nephew. He wanted to make sure. So he asked his sister, the Prophet's aunt, Safiya. Safiya is the mother of Zubair. Zubair. So she, he told her, Ya Safiya, go and check, check, investigate, and then come back. So Safiya went towards the house of Khadija. Khadija's maid saw Safiya. So she ran. It is said Khadija was about to sleep. She came running. She told her Safiya, the aunt of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, Wali Muhammad. The aunt of the Prophet is coming. Well, I mean, Prophet's from me. He was not yet uh, a messenger at the time. Although he was a Prophet, not yet a messenger. But the aunt is coming, Safiya. So she immediately got up and she told her, prepare everything for her, get things ready. So she welcomed her. And then Safiya said, I came here to ask you a question. Is it true that you are interested in marrying my nephew? She said, yes, I am. So she smiled. She was very happy. So she went back to Abu Talib and she told him and the uncles of the Prophet that go immediately now and ask for the marriage. Khadija wants him. And he wants her as well. So Abu Talib then went. Khadija was from a tribe known as Bani Zuhra. 
the eldest one or the most honorable person of the tribe at the time was her uncle, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Abu Talib came to him and he told him that Alhamdulillah illadhi ja'alana min zar'i Ibrahim wa min wadhurriyati Ismail. This is how he started. Praise be to Allah. This is the start of the speech of Abu Talib. At the nikah. In the nikah, it's mustahab to give a khutbah. He starts by saying, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. And then he brings their, their ancestry, who, who they come from. Alladhi ja'alana min zar'i Ibrahim, among the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail, specifically. And then they come and they tell you that this Abu Talib is kafir. The man is beginning his speech with Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet became a messenger, he comes to him in a line of poetry. He says, Anta nabiyu la kathib. Anta ibn Abdul Muttalib. You are the Prophet and there is no doubt about it. No doubt. You are the Prophet. And you are among the progeny of Abdul Muttalib. You are the son of Abdul Muttalib. You come from honor an honorable tribe. And when he says that you are the Prophet and there is no doubt about it, what's the difference between this and between saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam? Nonetheless, we'll come to that, inshallah. So that's how he began his speech. And he continued on, continued on saying that if all of the people were to be measured against my nephew, my nephew would be the best of all of them. When he finished his sermon, it was Waraka's turn to give the speech. So he gave a speech. Some historians say, no, he couldn't even give a speech. He couldn't give a speech to match what Abu Talib had said. So Khadija from behind the curtains, she gave a speech. Nonetheless, then the nikah was recited between Khadija and the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And when upon that, the, the Khadija told the Prophet that she called Quraysh and she, she, she said, Ya Quraysh, bear witness that everything I have, I give it willingly to the Prophet Muhammad, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Everything, I give it all to Muhammad. So, this lady then, who had everything, she supported the Prophet. She helped the Prophet. She was the person who gave children to the Prophet. She gave him all her wealth and her money. And she was the best of the Prophet's wives, no doubt. Many writers narrate that there is another wife who was the best. Another wife. She was the best. Although they narrate, not us. Now for the sake of time, I don't have time to give you references. But anybody who is interested, please come and see me. She says one day an old lady came and the Prophet honored her so much. She asked him, I've seen you honoring people, but not like her, not like this lady. You're really taking care of this lady. How come? He said, because she was a friend of Khadija. And that's why she reminds me of Khadija. So every time she comes, I respect her so much. So she said, this lady said, you know, in another hadith, she says, there is no person that I used to feel jealous more of than Khadija. Although she never lived with her in the same time. The Prophet never married another woman when he was married to Khadija. She said that she was the most person that I was jealous from. Nonetheless, she continued, this lady, she said, Why do you keep remembering an old lady from Quraysh when Allah has replaced you with much better? Younger, better. She, she narrates that the Prophet became angry 
But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa when he becomes angry, he becomes angry to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the anger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He controls his tempers, he controls himself. He told her, no, God has not replaced me with a better wife. She gave me at a time when people deprived me. She gave everything she has to the Prophet. When Muslims were in Shu'ba Abi Talib, when they were under boycott, when there were sanctions upon the Muslims, she gave all her money to support them. And the interesting thing, they say another man, you know, another man, they say he was so wealthy, they say, that he used to love to spend money on Rasulullah. That other man is the father of this lady, the other lady we're talking about, her father. She narrates that my father had million, million gold coins, million. That even historians, they say, you know, it's just in Arabic before, they didn't have the word million. They had alf for alf, means a thousand, thousand. Historians, when they come to that, they say, you know, it's impossible because even the kings don't have that much money. So maybe there was a mistake. Maybe it's 1,000. Not alf for alf. Maybe it's just one alf. But it's not even, not even an alf. The man was a tailor. And then he became a teacher. And we don't hear that he had wealth. Certain tribes, certain people were wealthy. Yes, no doubt. Bani Umayyah were wealthy. Bani Makhzum, like Abu Jahl, was wealthy. Certain tribes were known. They had money. His tribe were not known. But nonetheless, this is among what people try to give to them of merits. And we'll come to that, inshallah, shortly. So he says, and if he had money, you know, the interesting thing, if this man had money, where was his money when the Muslims were sanctioned in, in, in Shu'ba Abi Talib? Where was his money? We don't hear that anything was spent on the Muslims other than the money of Khadija. So Khadija gave and she spent everything. You know, today we have people who call themselves humanitarians. You know, they give philanthropist. You know, you hear that term a lot, philanthropist. Khadija was one of those individuals back those days before the concept of philanthropy was even established in this day and age. She gave. The Prophet says, she gave me when people de deprived me. She believed in me at a time when people belied me. People told me you're a liar. But she believed in me. Historians agree, the first lady to believe in the Prophet was Khadija. And the first man, the first person was Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. In Nahj al Balagha, Amir al Mumineen says, I was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he received the revelation. And I told him, I am hearing voices. What's this voice that I'm hearing? The Prophet told me, Ya Ali, you hear what I hear and you see what I see, except that you're not a Prophet. You're not a Prophet. And they narrate, there is a man by the name of Afif al Kindi. Afif says, I was a businessman. Every now and then I used to stop in Quraysh and do business, do trade. One day I came and I was doing trade with Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle. Him and I were doing some trades. I was selling him stuff and he was buying stuff from me as well. We were in Mina. Then we saw, I saw a man coming out of a tent facing the Kaaba. Behind him there was a little man, a young man, there was a young man behind him, following him, and behind the young man there was a lady, they were all following, he started praying behind him, or on his right, on his right was this young man, and behind him were this lady, I asked Al-Abbas, I said, who is this, what's going on here, he said, the man who is in the front, that's my nephew, Muhammad, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And he claims that he receives revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the young man who's praying behind him is my nephew, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the lady who's praying behind him is Khadija, his wife. These are. So among the first people to pray were those individuals, those two, behind the Holy Prophet. So she believed me, the Prophet says, when others belied me, others denied me. 
And then he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me children from her, but made you sterile. He does, you don't have children. So Allah did not replace me with another one better than Khadija. Now, this is the greatness of Khadija. Now, but was Khadija saved from the distortion of history? No. Historians, especially at the time of Bani Umayyah, and even after the Prophet, in fact, people tried to take the attributes of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, especially Amir al they tried to take his attributes and give it somewhere else. Or try to get some attributes to other people that they didn't have. For example, saying this man is rich and he used to love spending on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is one of the things. Whereas if you read history, it says no, he wasn't rich. He wasn't rich. Taking the title of Amir al-Mu'mineen, for example, As-Siddiq. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Ana As-Siddiq al-Akbar wal Faruq al-A'zam. I am Siddiq, I am Faruq. They took this title away, they gave it to the first and they gave it to the second man. They came and they manipulated and distorted the Ahadith saying that this lady is the most favorite wife of the Prophet. Why? She's the youngest one. She was the youngest of them all and hence she's the best. She's the most favored. And among the accusations that Khadija got is that she had married before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That the Khadija was married before Rasulullah. And other accusations or another things that they have they say that the Prophet had children from Khadija, daughters, whom he gave in marriage to the third Khalifa. Two of them, in fact, he gave in marriage to the third Khalifa. And that's why they call the third Khalifa, they give him a title. Do you know what the title is? The Nurain. The Nurain. The man with two Nur, with two lights. Why? Because he married two of the Prophet's daughters. Now let us briefly over the next 20 or so minutes take a look at this. First of all, was Khadija married before Rasulullah or wasn't she? Second, did she have children if she was married? Did she have children or not? Third, did the Prophet marry his daughter to those individuals or not? Briefly, we'll take a look at this. Anyone who's interested for further details and clarifications, there are great, two great books written by a great analyst in Qum, Sayyid Ja'far Murtaba Al-Amili. That's his name, Sayyid Ja'far Murtaba Al-Amili. He's written a couple of great books about this issue. One of those books is called Banatun Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Amraba Ibih. The Daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi or the ones whom he raised the ladies whom he raised. And the other book that he has written is also about the truth in the tradition of the Holy Prophet. As-Sahih min Sirat al-Nabi al-A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa alih. Those two books. As-Sahih min Sirat al-Nabi al-A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa alih. And the second one is Banat al-Rasul or Banat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alih amra ba'ibih. You can read those two books. I'm not sure if they're available in English. So there's an enticement for you, basically, to learn Arabic, inshallah, so you can read these two books, inshallah, among others. Nonetheless, we'll briefly summarize what's written in these couple of books. First of all, was Khadija married before Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Some historians say yes, she was. But the question is, what this analyst really analyzes thoroughly is who were those people who she was married to? Who were they? If we take a look in history, we see there's a lot of conflict. Some people say the man's name was an nabash ibn Zurara. Others say, no, his name was Zurara ibn nabash Other way around. And then they say that the, she married another man by the name of Atiq. But if we take a look at this lady, you know, logically, 
Khadija was one of the honorable, one of the most honorable ladies in Quraysh. All of the honorable people in Quraysh tried to get married to her. People who were wealthy, rich, from famous tribes, she rejected all of them. Then she comes and she marries someone whom we don't even know who he is in history. We don't even know who he exists. The Prophet comes from Bani Hashim. The Prophet is a great man. She heard so many merits about him. And in a hadith from Ahlul Bayt, we know that she was a muwahida. Khadija was a muwahida. She was a believer in Allah. Because when we turn to Imam Hussein alayhi salam in ziyarat Warith, what do we say to Imam Hussein? Ashhadu annaka kunta nuran fil aslab al-shamikha wal arham al-mutahhara. Lam tunajjiska al-jahiliyyatu bi anjasiha. That none of your forefathers ever was mushrik. Ya Aba Abdullah. You are nur. In the purified wombs. Arham al mutahara. So Khadija was a muwahida. And she knew the Prophet indeed was a prophet. And hence she married him. Even though he was poor. Poor money is nothing. He comes from an honorable tribe. He's an honorable man. But those two other individuals, we don't know who they are. One of them from Bani Tamim, they say. Bani Tamim, poor people, we don't know anything about them. So she leaves all those rich people and she goes to marry these individuals whom we don't even know much about them in history. So many historians agree that Khadija never married before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. From both schools of thought. Shia, all of them agree. Or most of them agree. And from the other school of thought, there are also people who are reliable and reputable who agree as well. So that's with regards to Khadija marrying before the Prophet. She was not married. Next comes the questions. So then what about the children? What happened? Where did those children come from? Did the Prophet get his children married to the third Khalifa? Well, let's take a look at the things. When did the Prophet marry Khadija? What year? The most accurate reports indicate that he married Khadija three years before the Ba'tha, before he became a messenger. Three years before he became a messenger. So if three years before he became a messenger, and most historians, most of them, agreed that all of the Prophet's children, except one, some of them they say that he had a son by the name of Abd Manaf. He was born before his message, before his birth. Otherwise, all his children, Al Qasim, that's why we call him Abu Al Qasim, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Abdullah, his son, both. Al Qasim was the eldest, Abdullah was the second son. And then he had daughters also by the name of Ruqayya. Zainab and Umm Kulthum and Fatima. Okay, salamullahi alayha. And Fatima apparently was the youngest. Or there is a question among historians. But nonetheless, they were born after the Ba'tha. So after the Prophet was a messenger. Okay, they say, well, two of his daughters, they say, Umm Kulthum and Zainab or Qayya, she was married from one of the daughters or two of the children of Abu Lahab, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, sorry, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum were married to two of the sons of Abu Lahab. That's what they say. When the ayah was revealed, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab and Watab, Abu Lahab told his sons, divorce them. So they divorced those two, two, two girls and they returned back to Rasulullah. It is said after that, then the third Khalifa married one of them. He married basically Ruqayya. And he migrated with her to Habasha, to Ethiopia. She was pregnant on the ship, but she aborted the fetus. The fetus died. The fetus died. So we asked the question, the Muslims migrated to Habasha in the year six after Ba'tha, Ba'tha, not Hijra. So six years after the Prophet became a messenger. Muslims migrated. 
And Muslims agree that the daughters of the Prophet were all be, uh, born after the Ba'thah. How old was Ruqayya then to be married to the third Khalifa and to have a child as well, to bear a child as well? How old was she? So when did that happen? Numbers don't add up. So, and the interesting thing, you know, the historians, those people who really tried to push this idea, they say that although Abu, Abu Lahab, two of his sons married two of the Prophet's daughters, they actually were, both of them, they never had the material, you know, the husband-wife relationship. So both of those ladies were still waiting for who? Waiting for their husbands to divorce them so that the third Khalifa would marry them and then he would be the first person to see them. So for years, they were just having, you know, no relationship. Sometimes in history, I mean, it's amazing sometimes what you read in history, but if you just pay a little bit of attention, you see things just don't add up, don't make much sense. So then what is it? Who did he marry then? Because we know that there, were, there was a Ruqayya, there was an Umm Kalthum, there was a Zainab. So where did they come from? Here is the story, brothers and sisters. Khadija had a sister by the name of Hala. All right? Hala married a man. And she gave birth to a daughter. Then she was separated from this man, or this man died. She married a second man. That second man had two daughters already from a previous marriage. He had two daughters. Then what happened is Khadija's sister died. This man, the father, also died. So these three daughters were left with nobody to take care of them. Who took care of these daughters? Khadija, her nieces. Or basically the children who were raised by her niece, by her, by her sister. All right? Is that clear? So we have it, you know, I understand it's Ramadan and now people are just tired. But basically, Khadija's sister had one daughter and then she married a second man who had two daughters already from a previous marriage. Their names were Zainab, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthu. The Prophet then took them with Khadija and started raising them. And the Arabs, they used to call a person who raises the children, they used to call them as his daughters. His daughters. These were the ones who the third Khalifa married two of them. When they say he married Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, he married these. This Ruqayya and this Umm Kulthum. Not the daughters of the Prophet. Apparently the daughters of the Holy Prophet ﷺ died at a young age. They did not survive. The only person who survived was Fatima sallallahu alayha, who also was killed at a young age, at the age of 18. So, brothers and sisters, the third Khalifa did not marry the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, direct daughters. He married children or daughters who the Prophet raised, and hence they were called the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But in history, they wanted to make a match. How could Ali ibn Abi Talib be the son-in-law of the Prophet by himself? Well, if Ali ibn Abi Talib married only one daughter, the other man married two. Two of them. If Ali takes one nur, these two, this man takes two. So history comes to this. And interestingly, if we take a look at history itself, we never find somebody among the companions, the close companions, saying that Uthman is, or the third Khalifa, Uthman, is the son-in-law of the Prophet. Even they came to Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar, they came to him after the killing of Uthman. They came to him. It is said two people who were Kharijites against Uthman and against Ali ibn Abi Talib. They came to him and they told him, what's your opinion about Uthman and Ali? What's your opinion? They wanted him to say that both of them are bad, so they basically have a reason and justification to go and fight against Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, Uthman, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him and you people didn't forgive him. What was he referring to? He's referring to the battle of Uhud. The battle of Uhud, he's saying that Uthman ran away. Like all other Muslims, they ran away. But Allah forgave him. Allah forgave him. Allah forgave those Muslims for running away. But you people didn't forgive Uthman and you went ahead and killed him. Now, interesting analogy here. You know, at that time in Uhud, there was a reason, there was a justification. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe because Islam was young, he wanted to keep the Muslims together, he forgave those people who ran away. But it doesn't justify what the third Khalifa did later on. Stealing people's money, stealing people's wealth, keeping it all together for himself. That doesn't justify it then. You know what happened there? It doesn't mean that, you know, we forgive him now. A wrong is a wrong. Even Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi he says, يَخْضِمُونَ مَا لَلَّهِ خِضْمَةَ الْإِبْلِ نَبْتَةَ الْرَبِيعِ They eat the wealth of Allah, the wealth, the money of the people, like cattle that eat the grass. That's how they went on eating this, him and his family. Then, Abdullah ibn Umar, he says about Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says he is his cousin, the Prophet's cousin. And he is his son-in-law. And this is his house. He pointed at the house of Amir al the house of Fatima alayhi salam, right next to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He said, so what do you mean? What, do you, what, do you, what, do you want, what else do you want about Ali ibn Abi Talib? He did not use the word son-in-law to attribute to who? To the third Khalifa. He did not say this man is his son-in-law. He said Allah forgave him. He couldn't find a better excuse than saying that Allah forgave him and you people didn't forgive him. But to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he said no. He said he is the cousin, son-in-law, and he, his house is right next to the house of Rasulullah. It's the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If the son of Umar Abdullah, if he knew that this man, the third Khalifa, is also the son-in-law, he would not have hesitated to say it. But he knows he's not the son-in-law. This is one of many proofs that are given to indicate that indeed this third Khalifa did not marry the direct daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Prophet had children from Khadija, Umm al muminin and he had one son by the name of Ibrahim from another wife by the name of Maria, Mary, al Qubtiya. Maria. And they all died at a young age, except Fatima sallallahu alayhi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that his progeny goes from this daughter, Fatima sallallahu alayhi And he gave him a beautiful consolation when he told him, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. We've given you great abundance, lots of blessings. So be grateful to Allah. Pray to Allah and do nahar. Raise your hands when you pray. The man who's telling you that you don't have progeny, he himself doesn't have progeny. Al-As bin Wa'il, the so-called father of Amr bin Al-As. He called the Prophet when his son died that he has no son anymore. Khalas, we don't have to worry about him. He has no progeny. Once he dies, it will be over. The ayah or the surah was revealed. So this noble lady who gave everything for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, she was never married before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She gave children to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Those children, one of them, Fatima, grew up and she married Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi. And she gave everything she has to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi until she left this dunya. When she left this dunya, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi went into grief, into agony, into pain. He buried her. And in the same year, his uncle Abu Talib also died. So he called that year as the year of Huzn or grief. Amul Huzn, the year of grief. That's another proof that Abu Talib was also a Muslim. He called the year, year of grief. And then when he came back from burying Khadija, it is said his daughter Fatima sallallahu alayha saw her father. She said, Father, where is my mother? Where is my mother? The Prophet didn't know what to respond. 
It is said Jibra'il alayhi salam descended upon the Prophet at that moment. He said, your Lord sends you his salam and commands you, Ya'muruka, Rabbuka. Your Lord commands you to tell Fatima that her mother is in a palace in Jannah. He uses different words, I'm paraphrasing. In a palace in Jannah, and she is next to Maryam and Asiya. She is next to Maryam and Asiya. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam at that moment takes care of her, of Fatima sallallahu alayhi and he hugs her and he tells her, your mother is in good care. She is between Maria and Asiya. So Fatima alayhi salam says, Allah huwa salam wa minhu salam wa ilayhi salam. I say, Ya Rasulullah, I wish you were there to take care of your daughter Fatima when the door was pushed against her. At that moment, she was all alone. No one to take care of her. She fell down and she cried, Ya Fidda Adrakini, O oh, Fidda, come help me. Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein alayhim as salam say, We saw our mother, our mother falling down on the ground, and they took our father to the masjid with his hands tied in the ropes. We didn't know what to do. Shall we stay with our mother Fatima or shall we follow our father Amir al Mu'mineen alayhim as salam? I say, Ya Rasulallah, I wish you were there. When they denied Fatima from crying and weeping for you on your grave. Ya Rasulallah, I wish you were there to see what calamities were witnessed on your family. I wish you were there to see and to comfort Zainab alayhi salam in Karbala. I wish you were there in Sham when that little girl Ruqayya came to her aunt Zainab. Zainab قالت عم أين والدي الحسين Oh my aunt where is my father Abi عبد الله الحسين Now you were able Jibra'il came to you Ya Rasulallah and told you to tell Fatima that her mother is in Jannah but what shall Zainab عليها السلام tell this young lady shall he, should, should she tell her that your father has been killed has been martyred you will never see him again she told him, my, she told her, my little girl, your father is in a long journey, suffering tawil. And then when the news reached the palace of Yazid, he said, take the head of her father to her. They brought the head of her father to her covered. When she removed the cover, she saw the head of her father covered in blood. She threw herself on the head of her father crying, خضب شيبتك أبا من للنساء والأيتام آه يا والدي والله نظيم أنا أصير من زغر يتيم Ah, Ya Rasulallah, I wish you were there to see that little daughter joining her father, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. At that moment, Imam al Sajjad turned to his aunt Zainab, قال عم زينب ارفعينا فلقد فارقت الحياة. Oh, my aunt Zainab, remove her from the head of my father, for she has joined my father, Abi Abdullah. Zainab came to the little girl. She turned her around. She saw that she has died. She carried her, looked at the head of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Qalat Abu Abdullah. 
look at your sister Zainab all alone with no help and no support. Inna lillah. Wa inna ilayhi raj'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun. والعاقبة للمتقين مؤمنين ومؤمنات كيف سنة شوي بدعاء This is the time when the prayer is accepted insha'Allah in these last few moments before we break our fast this is the time when dua is accepted ask Allah for your hajat you are here the guest of Khadija this honorable lady بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم ارزقنا حج بيتك الحرام في عامنا هذا وفي كل عام واغفر لنا تلك الذنوب العظام فإنه لا يغفرها غيرك يا رحمن يا علام رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربيان صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل على